Hi, I'm Tom Marino. At Cone Resnick, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank. Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. The Russell Berry Foundation. Fedway Associates, Inc. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC. And by Health First New Jersey. This is One on One. That's good acting, man. <laughs> I'm a fool for you, man. I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time. Like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I wouldn't survive it, but I knew I would. Well, welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. I want to introduce you to a fascinating gentleman I just met. But I'll tell you what, if the conversation we're having off the air is half as interesting we're about to talk about, it's going to be great. great. Richard Garber is associate professor at NGIT's College of Architecture and Design and partner in Grow Architects. Good to see you. Very nice to see you. Thanks for having me. The conversation we were just having was about uh, sustainable design. Yeah. What the heck does that mean? Yeah. Well, you know, I think um, there's a lot of interest in, in, in this kind of design right now and in green living and that sort of thing. And I think what we try to do as architects, as educators, is really um, bring a lot of different factors of sustainability together and, and really um, produce products, houses, buildings, et cetera that really um, speak to holistic living, a sustainable holistic lifestyle. Living. Translate yeah. that, give us an example. Well, I think you know it, it's everything from thinking about the building, uh, thinking about the materials in the building, how the building is produced, to how um, smart design may lead to um, different choices, better choices in terms of how people live their lives. And I think that's been something that um, you know has occurred to me really lately uh, as we've been engaged in some larger projects. Uh, in in New Jersey and in, in the communities that I, I grew up and live in, and uh, you know, really allowing people to make these choices has been significant. Let's break this down a little bit. Yeah. As we were getting ready for the program, I, one of the things I was thinking about is you you talk about like where you place a room. Sure. Has something to do with sustainable living. Give us an example of what isn't so sustainable and what would be more sustainable with respect to where you would place a room. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, design um, largely in, in, in some ways, especially kind of housing development and that kind of thing, has become cookie cutter, has become, uh, you know, formulaic. And, um, you know, with some of the tools we use, some computational tools, some rules of thumb about sustainable living, we can really begin to simulate how our buildings will perform given a site, given mm -hmm. environmental factors, given orientation to the sun. Uh, so, uh, just with some smart passive design, we can really... Uh, use it. it's, that's the word that I yeah. keep hearing. Yeah. Passive design. Passive design. That means actually that before you throw any kind of technology, before there's any moving parts, you uh, as an architect really think about how the organization of a building, of a house, of a structure, really responds holistically to environmental factors. So we'll look at things like daylighting. Uh, you know, if you can use the sun to light buildings, you don't need to spend money on electricity. What are we looking at that right there? Thing. Uh, that's pretty fab. That's a single family house we completed about three or four years ago in Jersey City. Completely sustainable. Client does not pay energy bills, gets a check back what? from PSENG. What? Check back from PSENG. They get a check back from PSENG. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because? Well, you know, in, in terms of that, the, the, that, that house is unique in that it's um, a 100% precast concrete solution. So uh, typically when you look at a house like that, um, 1,600 square feet, thereabouts, uh, it's stick framed out of wood. What we did was we worked with a, um, a precast concrete company to make highly insulated uh, monolithic walls uh, that went up in three days as opposed to three months or four months or something like that. And um, they, they, uh, they serve to store energy by right. day and uh, let energy off at night. They work uh, kind of as a heat sink in a, in, in a way. And we coupled that with um, operable windows, some well-placed ceiling fans. Uh, the house stays very cool in the summer. It was in there in July a couple of uh, last summer and it was about 76 degrees uh, inside, no air condition. Um, and there's a small PV array, about 280 square feet of photovoltaics 
Oh, the we're using a lot of jargon, photovoltaics and... Yeah, photovoltaic panels. So, um, photovol and that's solar? That's solar, that's solar, that's right. So we have um, solar panels on the roof. Um, that house was actually designed um, in the computer. And so when we talk about um, making, simulating some uh, environmental uh, situations, we were able to pinpoint um, how the roof would pitch in a certain way so that it would get the most solar gain mm. through the year. And that's where we put the photovoltaics. That's how you wind up not paying energy bills. That's how you end up but the other thing energy. is that's a house. What about in a larger project? You have this Jackson Green project, yep. I believe in Jersey City, yep, New that's Jersey, right. 40,000 square feet. Do these same passive, if you will, design strategies work in a larger building? Yeah, they do. How they so? do. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the game is a little bit different because you're taking up more space on the block and that kind of thing. With Jackson Green, we were, we were tasked by um, the Jersey City Redevelopment Agency, who has been a great partner in this project, um, as well as a great not-for-profit developer called TRF out of uh, Philadelphia, to produce these, <coughs> um, these um, passively designed energy efficient houses. The budget is very small, so some of them um, as, as additional items will get there. It is under construction. What is, that is? That's phase one of the construction. So there's 22 units. We have four in the ground currently. We just broke ground two weeks ago, something like that. So we'll be done with um, this phase of the construction uh, by midsummer, something mm. like that. And then there's a second phase that's gonna start. What's interesting about these projects also is their modular design. So uh, what that means is that the projects are produced off-site right. and they're trucked to the site and assembled with cranes. So that, that uh, you know, makes the, the assembly process very quick. Uh, you save on uh, you know, labor and that sort of thing. And um, because the houses are actually, or the units are, are, are manufactured in a factory, there's a, there's a lot more tolerance that we can design into them. And um, it was a fantastic process to, to work on these in the computer, simulate them, do all the things we're talking about, and then literally send these files electronically to um, a fabrication plant that's in Pennsylvania. And they uh, worked with our, our digital data and, and basically fabricated these things. Fascinating, by the way, the NJIT website's been up throughout this program. NJIT is our partner, yep. um, academic educational partner on the higher ed end doing a series of these interviews, uh, looking at smart design, sustainable design, yep. particularly after Hurricane Sandy, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. More important than ever before? Absolutely. We're Absolutely. speaking to you and many of your colleagues, Richard Garber, Associate Professor at NJIT College of Architecture and Design and partner in Grow Architects. I want to thank you for joining us in One-on-One. -on -one. We've barely scratched the surface, more to talk about in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. One-on-One -on -one will continue right after this. It's interesting. Because if you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We are here at a very special place. This is the CHOP at Virtua Pediatric Department. I am pleased, very proud to introduce two gentlemen. Uh, if it were not for them, we would not be here right now. First, Rich Miller, President and Chief Executive Officer at uh, Virtua, and Steve Altshuler, CEO at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, otherwise known as CHOP. Chop. Good to see you, gentlemen. Good to see you. Good to see now, you. Let's put where we are in context. Rich, this partnership, very powerful. Yes. But where we are, just as powerful. Describe it. We're, we're actually in Voorhees at our new hospital location. Uh, and we're in the Voorhees uh, ED, emergency department. It's our partnership with CHOP, and it's fully staffed with CHOP physicians in our emergency department. So it's a very special, very unusual uh, partnership and relationship here. Talk about the partnerships, Steve. Yeah, so uh, we've been able to develop uh, a regional approach to uh, pediatric health care. Uh, our view is that you want to provide as much care in the community as possible. So by partnering with uh, Virtua, we can bring many of the subspecialists, including emergency room physicians, to the community uh, and it provides much better access uh, for patients. So uh, what we've tried to do is to say at our main campus in Philadelphia, we will only have the most acutely ill patients. Everybody else we want to care for uh, in the community. So our role is to build capacity uh, introduce more subspecialists uh, to the community and the relationship has worked really, really well. So Rich, in a lot of ways, for the South Jersey community, I mean, for the community you've served for, for mm -hmm. so long, what would it really mean? Be specific. For the children of 
South Jersey, this partnership with this extraordinary CHOP, this institution with this amazing brand, right? Mm -hmm. What would it mean for the children? It's very important for the children because CHOP is, is the specialty uh, location of choice in South Jersey. I mean, if you have the number one children's hospital in the country, in Philadelphia, and these are the Philadelphia suburbs, typically people will send kids uh, there. I would send my kids there. So the goal here is to keep kids in this local community. It's very important where they don't have to travel across the bridge for pediatric services and they can get them right here at Virtua. If the kids are really sick and need other support, uh, whether it's what we call quaternary or high level tertiary support, we'll fly the kids across the river into Philadelphia for those services. Let's break it down a little bit. Let's talk about some of the specific services here because sometimes, you know, again, CHOP for those, I was going to say for those who don't know, but that would be virtually impossible. Right, because the brand is well known. Um, people's first reaction, for those of us who are in the North Jersey area, very often they'll think of a very well known, very recognized hospital in the New York area. CHOP, for those in this part of the state we are taping in, in southern New Jersey and Voorhees, it's top of mind. Mm -hmm. Be specific. Let's talk about some of the very specific areas, the very specific medical, clinical challenges that we are talking about that for right here, at Virtua, this partnership means a big difference for parents and their children. Let's be specific. Sure. So you can start with where we're sitting right now. Right. Uh, you have very specialized pediatric emergency room services here. Same level, same quality that you have at the uh, CHOP main campus. Uh, you have CHOP physicians who are working in the neonatal intensive care unit. So let's start with neonatal intensive care. Right. Go ahead. So uh, I think, as you know, uh, one of Virtua's uh, major programs is in women's and children's uh, uh, medical care. And uh, a big part of that is they have a very large, very progressive uh, obstetrical service. An important part of obstetrics is to provide uh, the uh, care for the, for the baby once it's born. Some of them need more intensive care after births. So there's a very, very fine uh, neonatal intensive care unit here that is staffed by CHOP physicians. There's a pediatric intensive care unit, which is a uh, a very unusual service to be available in a community hospital. So again, what we're, what we're trying to do is as technology improves, as our clinical care pathways improve, we introduce more services into the community. So five, ten years ago, many of the children that would have been cared for in the pediatric intensive care unit would have had to go over to CHOP. Mm -hmm. Now they can, they, they can be cared for here, which is much better for the family and for the child. And, and let me just add to that, Steve. I think. It's important to understand that e even in this emergency department we're sitting in, typically em pediatric emergency departments or emergency departments in South Jersey in general, you would either see an emergency room physician or a pediatrician. And what you're seeing here, when patients come in here, they're going to see a trained pediatric emergency room physician. Well, hold on, Rich. What's the difference? There's a big difference in training. And the difference is that when, when, a, when a patient is seen by an ED physician, typically an ED physician in children has seen all kinds of illnesses and different diagnoses, different than a pediatrician, normal pediatrician would see in their office environment. So it's a, it's a very, very high skill set, different skill set. Next, you want to jump back in? Yeah, I just wanted to, to say to echo uh, what Rich has said. So uh, a pediatric emergency room physician has done three years of pediatric training and then an additional three years of fellowship training, specialized training, just in pediatric emergency medicine. So the level of skill, the experience with the type of you know, medical conditions you would see in this ER is really different than what you would see from a pediatrician or an adult trained emergency room physician. What does it mean to the families? Oh, I think it's huge to the families, Steve. I know, I, mean, I raised two girls and, and, and I want the highest level of care for your kids, every parent wants that. So when they come into their community hospital setting, they want to know that they have the best in breed of physician and caregivers in that setting. So it's, it's, this is a differentiator for parents in South mm -hmm. Jersey. This really is. This is a place to come and to feel comfortable that you're going to get the highest level of pediatric care. You know, I know there are several uh, areas, clinical areas, that you focus on, particularly when we're dealing with children. Childhood obesity, a big area that's important. Talk about it. It's huge. I mean, childhood obesity is one of the biggest problems we have in this country today. And that's another piece Steve and I are talking about, is looking at wellness and prevention in children. I mean, how do we, how do we take children before they get ill? And, and I think Steve, as a physician, can speak to the fact, 
you know, we're seeing type 2 diabetes in children. We're seeing hypertension in children, young children. The connection today. directly to, to, to obesity. obesity. Yes. To obesity, yeah. 30% uh, of all children by age 17 are morbidly obese. 30%. 30%. So imagine that. So, uh, you know, as Rich said, we're seeing children develop type 2 diabetes as early as age 4. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, a, it's a critical uh, area. And again, I think, you know, one of the, the reasons I like the relationship with Virtuous so much is that they're really focused on health and wellness, uh, you know, which is really big an theme. a big theme, an expanded view of what medical care really involves. So uh, part of what we're working on now and that, you know, when it's developed, we can bring to the community is this notion of a healthy weight initiative. Specific so the healthy weight initiative. weight initiative. So it's specific programs to help families cope and to really, in effect, retrain them on how they have to have their kids act in terms of eating habits, exercise, things like that. You know, ultimately, uh, the best way to do medicine is prevention, right? Prevent the disease from actually happening. And obesity is one of those things if you can prevent, you prevent a whole host of diseases in adulthood. Let me ask you this in the time we have left. The, the Virtua CHOP partnership, I'm trying to accomplish a lot of things here. But to what extent is this partnership potentially a model for other healthcare, hospital institutions to say, you know what, while we may be strong on our own individually, we can do a heck of a lot more for our patients, for their families together? Well, I think there's two aspects. I think with the cost of care being high, Steve, in this country, uh, you're going to need to lower the cost of care and raise the quality. And, and community hospitals in this setting shouldn't be all things to all people. You should look for relationships to build those relationships. We can't, we're not going to reproduce what CHOP does in no, this no, community. Probably, you probably shouldn't even try. Try to, we, when we won't. What we'll do is we'll complement each other and lean on the, the services that CHOP has in the quaternary and tertiary areas that By the way, what does it mean, quaternary and tertiary? Quaternary and tertiary are, are the level of service where, where kids get really sick and there's, okay. there's, there's an extension of what goes on in the community and care and that's the care that that is very expensive and and frankly you know you need specialty areas to really support those you know whether it's cardiac gastroenterology specialists that we can't get in the local community that CHOP as a specialty hospital can get but the potential model exists yes for others to say hey yeah yeah, yeah I mean you know again what I the way that we look at it is it's the right care at the right place with the right provider at the right cost. 95% of what we, what we do uh, as CHOP can be done in the community. Virtua is a better place for us to do it than our own main campus. As Rich said, it's more cost effective. We all have an obligation to society to have the highest quality care at the most appropriate cost. And this is the model that allows you to do it. Well, to, to Steve and to Rich, I want to thank you for inviting us in to sharing the story of Virtual and Shop coming together, it's important. It's important not just because of you're helping and serving the folks, uh, the, particularly the kids mm -hmm. and the families, but for everyone else in the healthcare world. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Yes. There he is, Ken Cullen, cancer survivor and involved with a great organization called Cycle for Survival. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Steve. We started talking about this a while ago. We should tell folks that uh, the other part of our lives, uh, other than the professional part of our lives, and the advocacy part, uh -huh. is we uh, coach baseball in That's our right. hometown of Montclair. That's right. Our kids play baseball mm -hmm. competitively, but they do it with good team spirit, right? Absolutely. Um, we started talking about this Cycle Sur for Survival initiative. What is it? Why is it so important? We're doing this right before an event on February 9, 2013, 10 cities across the country. Uh, New Jersey has a, playing a big role this right. year, but this program will air afterwards, mm -hmm. after the program, after the uh, event, so we don't want to date it. What is the organization? Why is it so important? Cycle for Survival is an organization that funds research on rare cancer. Rare. Define rare. Rare is it, it's sort of a misnomer, Steve, because if you take all of the cancers that are considered rare and you add them up, they account for more than half of all cancer diagnoses. Like? Pancreatic cancer is rare, ovarian is rare, leukemia is rare, right. stomach cancer is rare. All pediatric cancers are rare. You put them together. Mm -hmm. That's not rare. No, it's not rare at all. Well, then, wh then the, the, why don't they get more attention? They should, but the issue is 
all of, pr pretty much all of the funding goes to the four main cancers. Breast, breast cancer. colon, colon uh, prostate, prostate, and lung. And lung. Yeah. And so if you're outside of the big out, four, right. if you will, right. it's much harder to get money, right. media attention. Mm -hmm. So this organization started. Who started the organization? Jennifer Goodman Lynn and her husband Dave Lynn uh, right. started this organization back in 2007. And it started very small in, in an Equinox club in Manhattan. The Equinox, the gym? Yeah. Right. They're, they're a founding partner of this event. And now they, they have the event in 10 cities all across the country. And Summit New Jersey for the first time is, is uh, participating this year. This That's the 2013 event. Yeah. So everyone, they go in cycle, mm -hmm. right? They go in and uh, I call it spinning at my right. the New York Sports Club it in Montclair. Spinning. Yeah. It is spinning, but I, I, cycling is a cooler name though. Right? <laughs> right. It's much more. It, it kind of rolls off the tongue <laughs> a little bit better than spinning for Okay, survival. so they cycle right. and they go in and they raise money. Okay, and by mm -hmm. the way, we're putting up the website team so people can find out more. Put up the website throughout the program. It is a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit organization. And did you know these folks when they started? And by the way, Jennifer uh, did in fact pass. She did in 2011, unfortunately, after a, a very brave battle with four cancer. years. For four years, yeah, four years, when five did, years, I think. Five, when did you hook up with them? I was diagnosed with a sarcoma six years ago, and Jen and I have a mutual friend. And when she found out that we both were dealing with sarcoma. I had a very different type than Jen did. Uh, luckily, I'm in remission right now. So, um, they decided to hook me and Jen up. And uh, as soon as I met her, she's she's a very dynamic force. And I knew that uh, she was going to offer a lot to cancer research because she was totally on it at that point. And she sucked me in. I mean, she sucked me in like she sucked a lot of people in. But I'm really proud to be a part of this event. I mean, it's raised more than 24 million dollars. Whoa! 24 million dollars in only is its seventh year. $24 million for mm -hmm. these rare, for rare cancers. cancers. And it goes to research? It goes to research, right. So it, f six months from the time of the event, they fast track this money right into clinical trials. Wow, what are we looking at right there? It's a check uh, ceremony, and I don't know the amount, but if it was last year, it would have been $8.3 million. In That's last what year they're telling me in the control room. Yeah. And, and again, how can people, if someone goes on the website, right, right. and say they go on uh, any time during the year 2013, 2014, whenever, right. can they find out if there, in fact, is, if, if there's an event, Cycle for Survival event in their area? In their area, absolutely, yeah. And Anywhere, can, I, listen, so say you want to go to Manhattan, there's one in Manhattan. Uh, there's two in Manhattan. There's two in Manhattan. Yeah, there's two Equinox clubs that do it in Manhattan. So is Equinox the partner? Equinox is a founding partner, and Memorial Sloan Kettering is a founding partner. Talk so, about the Memorial Sloan Kettering. Yeah, this piece. is important because whereas other charities have operation costs, so if you donate money, a portion of them, a portion of that money goes toward operation costs, staffing, et cetera, it doesn't... That's not the case in, in, you know, for Cycle for Survival. 100% of the money that you donate goes directly to cancer research. All of it. All of it. Because Memorial piece. Sloan Kettering is picking up the tab on, on all the operations. They have a big staff that helps run this event. Um, but the money that's donated does not go toward that. It just goes towards research. Let me ask you something. Because we've known each other a while and I see how passionate you are and, and how involved you are with the kids in the town and, mm -hmm. and baseball and you're so good with them. I'm curious about this. You're real passionate about this. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, I, I think I think the the point about rare cancers speaks to it. Um, that that there's so many people out there that are touched by these supposed rare cancers, uh, and there's very few treatment options for them because without the research, you can't have treatment options. When I was diagnosed, one of the scariest moment, one of the scariest moments was the doctor saying. We don't see this that often, so we don't know what exactly what the treatment protocol is. Uh, research is very sketchy, so there was you know, a lot of deciding to do in terms of how to be treated. And that's scary. Um, it kind of takes control away from you. So my involvement with Cycle kind of gives me some control. Control. Control to, that. Well, uh, control to, gain, to raise money. Control to, you know. Say you? That's me. You look very much in control. <laughs> I've seen you on the streets cycling, right? Yeah. I see on our that. Bikes. Uh, yeah, I, that's right. That's right. We've seen we live in the exactly. same neighborhood. Uh, but I see that picture and it reminds me of the energy in, in Cycle for Survival. I mean, it's, you, you've done the spinning before. Yeah, right? I love it. You take that and multiply it by 100 because, uh, you know, rather than 10 or 20 people, How many? you have, well, in, in, 
there's over 13,000 riders nationwide. 13,000. Yeah. And in New York, I think they, the Equinox Club in New York, one of them does 300 bikes. They have 300 oh bikes God. lining the floor. In Summit, New Jersey, there's going to be two, over 200 bikes. Fabulous. So imagine the intensity of any spinning class and multiply that by 100, and you get pumping music, you get these instructors that are really pumped up because there's a, you know, a lot of people participating. Do people get sponsors? Yes. Is that how you do it? Yeah, exactly. This is fabulous. Yeah, it's great. You know, I'm so glad you came up to me. I, I guess we were at a baseball tryout for the kids. Mm -hmm. and you said, hey, we ought to do this. And I'm like, eh. I said, you know, but if Ken's involved in it, it's got to be a good thing. It is a good thing. We'd love to get you out on a bike, Steve. Yeah, you know, I, I, And I'll tell you what, all, that tr all those cycling spinning classes I'm doing that don't raise any money for anyone, <laughs> I want to do it because it's worthwhile and it makes a difference. It's fantastic. Thank you. Listen, yeah. I'm proud of you. It's important. By the way, everyone who's been seeing the website throughout the entire program, go check it out. Um, if you're going to miss it this time, it doesn't mean you can't get it next time. Ken Cullen, Cycle for, for Survival. You're doing important work. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. See you on the baseball field. Yeah, I will, yeah. Thanks. That was great. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Now let's continue the conversation about this and other important topics and issues on Facebook. Visit my page at facebook.com slash Steve PhD. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years, the Russell Berry Foundation, Fedway Associates, Inc., PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC. And by Health First New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com Everything Jersey. And by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan is growing in the Garden State. Thousands of members in Bergen, Essex, Hudson, Passaic, and Union Counties depend on Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. And in January 2012, Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan will be available in Somerset and Middlesex counties as well. If you're eligible for Medicare and live in New Jersey, find out more about Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Feel good about your health care coverage.